My name is Leon Sindikumana, and thank you for all for coming, uh, especially guests from outside of the department, and also guests from inside of the department. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome you to what is the fifth annual Sambol's uh, lecture. The Sambol's lecture is made possible in part by a generous uh, anonymous donation. We are very grateful. I would like to thank the staff members of the Economics Department and Perry, who did an amazing job in planning and hosting this event. I also invite you to a reception downstairs on the second floor after the, uh, after the lecture. The Sam Bowles Lecture Series was established to honor the work of our colleague, Sam Bowles, who is here today, one of, the, <laughs> one of the founding members of what is now recognized as the premier heterodox department in the world. The department is proud of, of what Sam accomplished while he was here on staff full time, as well as how he continues to be a, a shining star in the economics department, uh, department, <laughs> economic profession, and an excellent ambassador for the department. The, four, the fifth Sam Balls lecture today is given by Professor Juliet Shaw, uh, who is a professor of, so of sociology at Boston College, but most importantly, a PhD graduate from here. Welcome, Juliet. Uh, we are proud of her work. And now I'm going to invite Sam to, to introduce the speaker. Thanks, Sam. It seems impossible, but it was 40 years ago when Julie was leaving here that uh, she gave uh, to me and my kids uh, a little tree, like this tall. And uh, this morning, as I was thinking about those 40 years, I looked out of my window, and there across the field is this tree which is now three times taller than my house. Uh, that tells you something about how things have uh, gone on since, uh, since she left. A lot has changed, and uh, she's done wonderful things. I won't go into that, because I know we want to get on to hear uh, what she has to say. Uh, but uh, uh, she, after leaving here, she, uh, she taught for 17 years at Harvard in economics and women's studies. She's now an economist teaching as, uh, in a sociology department. Um, I, I want to give you some idea of the breadth of her work. Um, and how she goes about working on problems. She won the Leontief Prize for advances in economic theory, and she also won the American Sociological Association's Award for Public Understanding in Sociology. She is a genuine multidisciplinary person. She, she, uh, she, she gravitates towards questions. The tools are secondary. They are whatever is needed to answer the question. Uh, um, uh, she's also done some stunning research, which I think hasn't been recognized, like a few of her other blockbuster titles. She wrote what I think is the best research on how labor effort, worker effort, responds to local labor market conditions. I think it's the best study out there, except that it's not out there. Uh, she was busy doing things which she thought was more important than that, and <laughs> so it never got published. It's never published, right? I mean, this is by far, I think, the best work, and there's some very good pieces of work come out recently by Liz here and others. Uh, so, uh, but she, um, she was moved to write important uh, works, uh, one of which became a real blockbuster, uh, The Overworked American, The Overspent American, Born to Buy. Now, if that sounds a little dreary to you, all of these horrible things, I, I, I didn't know that she had a book with a subtitle how and why millions of Americans are creating a time-rich, ecologically light, small-scale, high-satisfaction economy. Now, who could be against that? Um, uh, she founded South End Press, a co-founder with other people from uh, this uh, wonderful department. She was also a founder, uh, co-founder of the Center for Popular, Popular Economics, also here. Uh, she founded the Center for New American Dream, and many other things I am not mentioning. Um, uh, she's a great public intellectual. Uh, I think uh, some of you know she's also a great teacher. Uh, she won the, Distingu the University's Distinguished Teaching Award uh, here uh, in this department. She's one of the very few uh, of us, of our community, who ever has won that. It's a very rare uh, honor. 
uh, uh, the legendary Steve Resnick, uh, who's a fantastic teacher, he won it. Uh, Melissa Osborne won it, a couple of other people, but uh, obviously she was recognized for being a truly outstanding uh, teacher uh, here. She also won, uh, listen to the title of this thing, the George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contributions to, now get this, Honesty and Clarity in Public Language. Now that's a concept. Couldn't we, couldn't we try that? How about honesty and clarity in public language? I mean, we really need you, Julie. <laughs> Keep it up. Um, you know, uh, I sometimes see Julie when I'm going through airports, which is the only time I actually see a TV screen. And, um, uh, you know, people, uh, uh, she, she, she's related to what people care about. Uh, and uh, people ask about her work. Uh, um, Kenneth Galbraith once told me uh, that he had the impression that his colleagues at Harvard, uh, they, they only read his books because they were afraid that their cleaning ladies were going to ask him their, uh, ask their opinion of what the bu books were. And, uh, and that actually happened. Uh, that is, uh, I think that um, people who don't consider themselves to be economists read Julie's work. Uh, and if you're an economist and you haven't read the book, well, then you're kind of out of it, just like uh, some Harvard professor, you know, who, uh, uh, well, it happened to me. I was coming through customs once and uh, he said, what do you do? I said, I'm an economist. And he said, oh, what do you think of Galbraith? Uh, and, uh, you know, I had read Galbraith, so I could answer the question. Uh, um, the, um, but when I think of Julie's work and, uh, and her contribution, uh, o over the years. The person I think most about is Thorsten Veblen. There is a tradition in American economics and sociology uh, which, uh, which Veblen began, Galbraith was a representative of, and Julie is part of that. And, uh, and as an intellectual and as a political actor and as a public in, uh, intellectual, she's very much like that tree in my field, towering. Thank you, Julie. Uh, well, thank you. It's really wonderful to be here. On the way, I was counting the number of years since I first made that turn up into the um, onto the campus to get into Thompson Hall. And some of you in the room, probably not too many, may remember that when I made that turn, I totaled my car on my very first day of <laughs> <laughs> graduate school. Um, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's been an amazing uh, time since I was here. I'm so honored to be giving this lecture. Um, Sam was my advisor and he was an incredible advisor. I certainly have not lived up to the standards that he set for me, but um, at least I always do know what it is that you, you do owe your students and the way you are supposed to treat them because of the incredible uh, um, mentoring that I got from him. Um, and also what an amazing uh, graduate experience I had here. I feel, I often feel very sorry for my graduate students because life seems so much harder for them and it, it's, I think it's much more difficult today, at least in, uh, in my university, to have the kind of intellectual excitement that we had here at UMass. Um, it was just an all-consuming and just really, um, you know, kind of utopian graduate experience. Um, and I know that sounds kind of crazy because these days when we hear about graduate students, we hear about depression and pressure and stress and how horrible it is. But it was really fantastic and it was all about the ideas and the, and the work, and the reading, and the talking, and, and the research. So thank you so much, and thank you, Sam, for um, everything that you gave me. And uh, in the Q&A, somebody should remember to ask me about a cleaning lady story uh, connected to my books, and uh, it was a funny one, and the cleaning lady in question was Barbara Ehrenreich while she was doing research for Nickel and Dimed. Um, <laughs> And there was one more thing I wanted to mention from your, uh, from your research, or from your intro, but I'm, I'm forgetting it now. So is this, can we make sure this is off?
That's not on. It is off. Okay, yeah. great. Am I? I'm hearing a little something. Is it yeah, just coming out? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the funny thing. Of, oh yes, and why it was that I never published that paper because as you said it, I remembered why. So it's a Me Too story that about you know somebody that um, deserves to be talked about. Uh, so somebody please ask me about that in the question and answer too. Okay, so uh, just one more prefatory point here, which is I'm going to talk about research that I've been doing for the last, uh, well, basically starting in 2010, so almost a decade now, on what is called the gig economy or the sharing economy. And uh, the story as it relates to being here, giving the Samuel Bowles lecture, is that about you know maybe five or six years into the work, I was writing a paper about some findings that we had, which I'm going to talk to you about. <coughs> and you know I was well along with the and, and in fact we've had the finding, and I think I was writing up a grant application to do more research on it. And you know I've been thinking about and writing about this finding for quite some time. And it wasn't until that moment that it dawned on me that what we actually were seeing was the cost of job loss, which was what I wrote my dissertation about, Sam and I wrote on it. But you know, enough years had gone by that it wasn't the thing that immediately popped out to me. And it was, I was so pleased that I had come full circle to a finding completely independently, unconsciously, that got me back to the cost of job loss. So, what you have mostly, uh, unless you're researching and, and reading in this literature, um, what you probably have heard most about with the sharing economy is a kind of, it's good, it's bad, pro, con, very normative, political, public engagement about it. Um, so lots of people saying it's fantastic and here's Airbnb trying to get New Yorkers uh, to you know go easy on Airbnb, did a big uh, advertising campaign um, and pretty quickly on the very day that they put up these advertisements all over the city they were uh, you know written on. The shared economy is a lie. Joan Rivers was a bigot. Um, not exactly connected, but uh, <laughs> another, another great quote from that day for, for a paper that, or an article that came out in the mainstream press about um, what happened when they launched this advertising campaign and all the, the graffiti and the, 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 these things were defaced immediately was another one of these. I, I happen to have been there, so I was able to get these pictures was the dumbest person in your building is handing out keys to large numbers of strangers. <laughs> so there's been a lot of debate about, uh, controversy about Airbnb. And then of course, if you followed what's been going on in recent months, focusing on the labor issues, there's been a big fight about ride hail drivers in particular, but gig workers more generally. And number one, the treatment of gig workers and a lot of critiques of the increasing um, degradation of conditions of work and pay for ride hail workers, Uber and Lyft most particularly. Um, on May 8th there was the first global strike of ride hail drivers and in September uh, the California legislature passed and the governor signed into law a bill called AB, Assembly Bill Number 5, which makes them all employees. And the companies are now fighting this, they've put together nearly uh, well, 90 million at the moment to uh, have a ballot initiative. And on the other side, you see here the uh, this is a screenshot from uh, what the ride hail company, the platforms are sending to the drivers to tell them to go against AB5 because it's going to take away flexibility. So, a lot of controversy about the classification of these workers. And that also has been, you know, very much a pro con kind of thing. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, Instacart, which is one of the sort of most problematic platforms in the delivery space. Instacart is a platform where people go and do shopping uh, for people and then you know, deliver it to their homes, grocery shopping. Instacart workers went on strike for three days 
um, and the company immediately reduced their wages as a result of the strike. Um, what I wanted to do today is move beyond the pro and con, and there's lots of interesting things to talk about the pro and con, I'd be happy to in the, in the Q&A, but uh, to step back for a second and say, well, what are the analytics of these platforms? Sort of how do we understand them as economic and social entities? What are they doing? Uh, what's new, if anything, about platforms? A lot of people think there's nothing new about platforms. They're just the latest way to exploit labor in the same old ways that they've always been exploited. What difference does the technologies that they use make? Uh, of course, they use uh, sophisticated algorithms to do a lot of the work that historically has been done by management. Do they have unique features? Is employee status even feasible? The platforms say the whole model is based on the independent contractor status and that uh, shifting to employee status is going to uh, put them out of business. And how malleable are their current configurations? Meaning, are there things that could change about the way platforms are operating that might deal with some of the, some of the problems that the, the, negative, the critics are, are raising, but that might also retain some of the features that the proponents like. So um, I've done a multi-platform study, one of the few and also the biggest that I know about, uh, which is the qualitative. So there, there are surveys out there that survey people from lots of different platforms, but in terms of kind of seeing how these platforms are actually operating in the experience of labor and so forth. Um, very few multi-platform studies. So what a multi-platform study allows you to do is kind of figure out what's unique about the whole, the whole form. Um, and what I want to argue today is that this, these platforms represent a new kind of labor regime that is very different from what's come before. Um, and represents something both difficult, troubling, and I think very uh, uh, ripe with possibility. So a word or two about definitions. There are now lots of words which are being used to uh, define the, you know, what we've been studying. Uh, the first terminology that was used was collaborative consumption. And it, oh, you know what? I forgot to take out my notes. Okay, I'm going to do it without my notes. Uh, collaborative consumption, and collaborative consumption, really the key idea was um, an idle resource, an idle asset that could be used by the non-owner while it was idle. That's fine. I think I can. I think I'm good. Thanks. Um, so Airbnb being a classic case, you have a spare room, you rent it out to someone or you loan it out to someone. Sharing economy was, or uh, collaborative consumption, so it really it really uh, pertains to those, those idle assets, that idle assets idea. Um, labor, something like ride hail, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft, um, originally started as an idle asset uh, phenomenon because it was, the idea was that people were in their cars and they were going somewhere and they had a, a seat, a free seat next to them. Of course, it pretty quickly devolved into just a labor service with that, collaborative consumption or what came to be known as sharing economy dimension really not particularly relevant, particularly once people started to acquire cars for the purpose of driving them. So it came to look a lot like taxis with more sophisticated technology. Um, the on-demand economy also refers to those sort of labor services that people get on apps that come very quickly, <coughs> basically ride hail and delivery being the key ones. Circular economy speaks to the, to the growth of secondhand markets on platforms. I'm not going to talk about those today, but that's another part of what's been thought of. The peer economy, meaning it's person-to-person -person exchange, and um, I called it originally the connected economy, uh, connected consumption of connected economy. But I'm going to use the term sharing economy uh, in part because um, or I, I do use the term sharing economy in part because there was also a, a very important nonprofit dimension of the sharing economy, which I think is really relevant, has been key in the success of this sector, 
and is important, I think, for thinking about how to change it. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on the, the labor side and the gig. So gig economy, which is what I put in the title, is really the part of it that I'm going to focus on. OK, so what's really different and, and uh, important about this sector? Number one is the technology. So the technological innovations that make possible peer-to-peer -peer exchange, meaning person-to-person -person exchange, and basically undermine the need for, for corporations or companies who do various things in economic transactions. So what are the two key things? Number one, companies develop brand <coughs> reputations and reduce risk for consumers. And my study has focused on consumer services, but there, you know, a lot of these issues are also relevant for the business-oriented services, gig, gig work on things like Mechanical Turk and so forth, um, and then also business to business. But um, so when you have a peer-to-peer -peer situation, there you have incomplete information. Uh, asymmetries of information uh, among the peers. So how do I know that David Kotz is a reliable person to trade with? If David Kotz is, you know, part of a brand like Ramada Inn or Yellow Taxi, I know that the brand has done the work of vetting and so forth. But in a peer-to-peer -peer economy, you don't have that. And what the technology allows you to do is crowdsource ratings and reputation, and that actually came from other places like eBay is where, where a lot of that started. So that by seeing the five stars and reading the reviews, I can feel comfortable making a trade. And many of these trades are, are very they're in intimate trades because it might be somebody in your home or in your car. So they, they carry uh, high possibilities of risk. So number one, the technology reduced the risk associated, and even more than reducing the actual risk, it reduced the perceived risk, risk quite a lot. And number two, um, it also facilitates search, because one of the things about peer-to-peer -peer economies with lots and lots of small sellers is for the consumer, you have to go and you know, comb through the yard sales and the flea markets and so on and so forth. But the digital technology allows you to have nearly instantaneous search. So the technology enables a whole sort of really the growth of a, a new sector and sort of moving away from centralized provision, corporate provision in, in lots of areas. Um, what else was on my notes? Uh, one was cashless payments, which doesn't figure too big in the story. Um, another key thing is uh, ease of entry and exit. So the platforms are very open access, very easy to get on them, very easy to get off them. And that turns out to uh, be really important in my story. I had some other things I was going to tell you about here, and I now forget them, and I'm sure they'll come to me. Okay, so this is uh, this was the name of the project. It was funded by the MacArthur Foundation, officially ran from 2011 to 2018. I now have an NSF for the next three years uh, with the Future of Work program at the NSF to study algorithmic workplaces. So this work is continuing. And these <coughs> are the graduate students who worked with me on the project. They were all uh, PhD students in sociology. Um, and most of them now have their PhDs. So we took a case study approach. Is that funny that they all have their PhD? David's laughing. Oh, uh, we took a case study approach, and I'm going to show you all the cases that we did. In, in most cases, we interviewed users, we've interviewed consumers, but also earners on these platforms. In the case of Airbnb, we also scraped and have a national database and have done a lot of other things which are not sort of qualitative. But the, the material I'm going to talk about today, the labor stuff, is, is from qualitative data. Um, and we did, you know, we surveyed everybody, so we have some numbers too, but I'm not going to really talk too much about that. So we did Airbnb, Turo, which may show up in the slides as Relay Rise, it rebranded. It's basically Airbnb for cars, where you rent out your car when you're not using it to somebody. So not with a driver, the people who rent it do the driving. TaskRabbit, which is an errand site, subsequently um, 
acquired by IKEA, who still runs it. Uh, it still runs independently. Um, and a, a task they used to be called Rabbits, which may give you some sense of how the company felt about the people working there. Um, but you can you could just post a task. You could post anything that was sort of vaguely legal, and people would bid on the task. So they had an auction model. Eventually, they moved to something different, and we have people from both pre, both the, the auction model phase and also the once they had sort of posted wage rates for things. Postmates, which is a delivery service, will again deliver anything legal or vaguely legal. Um, it's the equivalent of Uber Eats. We did not do Uber Eats, but Postmates and Favor, which is another one of these uh, delivery sites, started as mostly bicycle couriers. Uh, now increasingly people are using vehicles. Uber, eventually I gave in and said, yeah, I guess we have to study Uber, which is what everybody was studying. Lyft. And then the final case that we did is a platform which is owned by the workers. It's a stock photography platform, so the workers are photographers or they're artists. They don't call themselves workers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. It has a different kind of analytics than some of the others, but you know some some similarities. So we've we've researched a lot of different things. Um, <laughs> We started also looking at nonprofits. I didn't include those in the cases, but alternative uh, economic forms like a makerspace, a food swap, a time bank, etc. Um, we looked at moral, sort of the moral and cultural dimensions of participation. We looked at the culture of Airbnb hosting. With our national database, we looked at racial discrimination and gentrification, and also ratings, how the ratings function on Airbnb. Uh, and, and racial dynamics there. We looked at platform labor and its relationship to income inequality, uh, new kinds of vulnerability among Uber and Lyft drivers, systems of labor control, which is what I'm going to talk about today, and the dynamics of platform cooperatives. So we've identified, and, and uh, I should say, back on the other slide was our project website. Most of our papers are there. I have a book coming out on this in September called after the gig, uh, how the sharing economy got hijacked and how we can win it back. And the next little bit of the talk comes from a review article that I've done with a labor sociologist called Steve Ballas, which is coming out in the annual review of sociology um, this summer. So there are four major approaches in the literature to understanding the analytics of these platforms. And um, I want to tell you what they are and then tell you what my alternative is. So the first comes from economists. And economists tend to focus on efficiencies and entrepreneurialism. So uh, the point that I made earlier about these technologies enabling peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Uh, so one of the things that economists have argued is that you can get many, much more self-employment in very small firms as a result of these technologies. And I think that's right. They also focus on the algorithms and what the algorithms can do. They can reduce management costs. They can get you increased efficiency in logistics. In ride hail, uh, for example, instead of taxis driving around in what are called wild goose chases, the algorithms can, uh, because they allocate the, the passengers to the cars, uh, they can get much more efficient matching. So they're really important matching technologies. They can lower search costs for consumers, as I already mentioned. They foster entrepreneurialism and self-employment. They can solve information deficits to reduce risks. Again, I mentioned that. Efficient payment systems. So economists tend to think this is a really great thing. It's going to yield all these benefits, and it's going to yield benefits to individuals. And it should reduce this uh, average size of enterprises, because individual, you'll have more and more self-employment as a result of it. Uh, some have gone so far as to say it's going to end employment because everybody can just be a self-employed platform entrepreneur. And this is also the, the sort of rhetoric of the companies. Um, I'm going to go through them and then tell you what I think is wrong with each of them. The second one is, is what we might call the algorithmic manager or, or my boss is an algorithm, which is a famous, you know, kind of popular meme that, that goes along. So 
people in the, uh, the camp of algorithmic management who tend to be either sociologists or lawyers, or legal, legal scholars, um, basically argue what's new about these, these entities is, that is the use of algorithms. And these algorithms are incredibly powerful and they can control all aspects of the labor process. And they're also powerful in, in terms of power dynamics because the firms can basically set the algorithms in ways that create long uh, sort of structural asymmetries of information between the company, the platform, and the, dri and the driver or the worker. Um, that gives the companies a structural power over the drivers. So for example, uh, some years into ride hail, the companies started blinding destinations to the drivers. So when dr drivers have to take a certain number of rides, but they no longer knew where the rides were going. Um, and that is the kind of a, uh, asymmetric information we're talking about. Another asymmetry that they're doing now is that they're charging the customer one price and they're calculating the pay of the driver on another price. This is especially true when you have long, long drives. And uh, so the workers complain, the drivers complain, they, you know, the customers might be getting twice, be char being charged twice the base that the driver. So these kinds of things. So this yields systemic power over the workers. Also a lot of criticisms of the lack of human content, uh, arbitrary decisions and so forth made by the algorithms. And of course, if you followed any of the debate about AI and algorithms, you know there are lots and lots of problems with algorithms associated with racial bias and gender bias and so forth. And uh, that actually shows up in some of the studies of gig labor also. So for example, the task fragment algorithm is uh, more likely to recommend white workers than black workers in some cities and so forth. Um, the third view is, it, it comes out of sociology, there's also a, a trend within economics, and that is basically arguing this is, there's really nothing new here. This is just a continuation of this drive to precarity that we've seen. So whether it's guys standing in the precariat work that, you know, did Eileen Applebaum's, you know, working on this back in the 1980s, a lot of economists working on the growth of contingent, temporary, part-time, alternative work arrangements, and so forth. So this, this, uh, this school of thought basically says, look, what's really important here is the precarity basically symbolized by the lack of W-2 employment and the, the uh, in, independent contractor, so-called 1099 status of virtually all gig workers. And that this makes them ineligible for all kinds of benefits. They have no job security. They have no rights. Um, when bad things happen, the platform says it's not our fault. It's, you know, this is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. We're merely facilitating an exchange. And so this has created a highly precarious situation for workers. But what's key in this theme is that this is something that has been going on with, you know, beginning in the 80s with the rise of neoliberalism and the decline of unions. And this is more of the same kind of neoliberalism on steroids. So this view really focuses on the legal dimensions of the business model, the legal dimensions of employment, the technological aspects of the platforms really don't play much role here because the story is the same. It's the fissured workplace. It's the uh, you know precarity, etc. Um, so it's a very untechnological, very much focusing on labor institutions and the regime of labor and the idea of a change in the resume, regime of labor. Um, and it's, it also has, a, you know, obviously a very strong normative dimension because it's very critical of these changes. And then there's a very small literature, we could call this the view as sort of the idea that platforms are chameleons, that they're really not anything on their own and it really depends, the way they are depends on where they are. 
And this is a comparative literature, particularly with Europe versus Europe and the US comparisons done mostly, well, uh, Kathleen Thalen, who's a political scientist, um, some of these others are economists, but basically they're looking at the ways in which st European states forced platforms to operate differently. So the Germans who pretty much kicked Uber out because it didn't conform to their laws, or the French who had been you know, fighting, the Swedes who forced Uber to change what it was doing and to conform to its taxi laws and so forth. So this idea says nothing really unique about platforms. All that matters is the regulatory context in which they operate, and that's really powerful. <coughs> okay, so what's, let me just say something about what the weaknesses of these four. So I think the economists uh, were these economists. It's not all economists. Uh, these economists who focus on the efficiencies and the technology, I think, are, are really, this is a really important point of view because the technologies do. I think the technologies really are, can be very efficient and they can do a lot. What they miss is the, the political economy. So they miss the ways in which the technologies affect power relations. Um, they, uh, uh, so between workers and the platforms, and then also between the platforms and the state. And there's a whole sort of, it's not so large, but there's a whole literature on the ways in which the platforms have been able to avoid regulation for the most part. And that's beginning to change a little bit, but they've been very successful. Um, and you know, there are a number of reasons for that. But there's a lot of power that's being exercised in this sector, and this approach is absolutely oblivious to it. Um, the algorithmic manager, it's interesting. It, it brought me also back to another, uh, another um, uh, faculty member who I worked with here at UMass, and that's Rick Edwards. Because his work is actually very, it, it's both still very present in this literature, but also really relevant for thinking about algorithmic management. Because one of uh, Rick's three, Rick had the three types of control, you know, direct or simple control, technical control, and bureaucratic control. I think, or, I don't know if I have the words right, many bureaucratic. But the idea that there's something new in the technology controlling the workplace is absolutely wrong. I mean, you know, you just have to think back to the assembly line and the idea that the assembly line controlled the process of work, the pace of work, etc. So the idea of using technology to control workers is a very old story, as everyone in this room knows, number one. Number two, the idea that the technology is somehow all powerful and takes away all ability of workers to resist or shape their own environments, et cetera, is also something we know from a lot of work that's been done in heterodox economics and sociology is wrong. Workers always will fight technological control and they will be more or less successful, you know, depending on whatever. So these, these folks, over, uh, really overstate the novelty and they overstate the power of the algorithm. And that's both because as we get more and more studies of these workers, we find there are lots of ways that workers resist the algorithm, including through technology. So for example, they get multiple phones and they trick the algorithm into thinking they're doing one thing versus another. They learn how to, for drivers, they learn how to drive their car in a particular way, which then makes the algorithm think something's happening. For the drop, for the delivery guys, we learn that they can tell the deliver, tell the algorithm they're on one kind of vehicle, but they're actually on another, and that affects what they get. You know, so people are fighting back against these algorithms. There are forums where they share information. Um, you have great uh, computer scientists who reverse engineering the algorithms to figure out how they work and so forth. So there's a lot of resistance to the algorithms. Um, and that's one of the things that's wrong with them. And, and there's another thing that's wrong with this story, which I'm gonna, gets me back to the cost of job loss, which I'll get to in a minute. So the precarity story, I've already noted that it misses the technology. And I think any 
analysis of what's going on without recognizing the technological innovations and dimensions here is, is very flawed. The technology does matter. It matters both because it creates possibility, but also it has really changed the way these entities are operating in comparison to conventional firms. So yes, there's precarity, um, but it turns out there's not precarity for everybody. And that's, again, cost of job loss. We're going to get that. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But our findings really cast doubt on the idea that all that's happening is more and more precarity. And the institutional chameleons, I think, understates the extent to which there are common features of platforms. The story is not always as different. And we might be getting more convergence here than, than uh, this, which is a kind of first, first round of things uh, <coughs> would suggest. And I may have forgotten one or two things that was on my notes. OK, so what are, oh, that's not turning out very good, sorry. Uh, what did we find, and what is my argument about how to understand these firms? So what's the analytic approach that I'm arguing? The first thing is the firms are engaged in what I call a retreat from control. So there are really important aspects of the labor process which conventional management attempts to control, but which these firms do not. They have given up, or they have ceded, is another word I would use, control over lots of things. Number one, their open access. Pretty much anybody can join. There'll be a few, you know, if you have certain kinds of criminal convictions or things on your record, you can't. But for the most part, they take all comers. Very different than conventional employers who screen people and hire for things. Number two, what that, one of the things that means is they get a very heterogeneous labor force. Much more heterogeneous than conventional firms. In a conventional firm, what happens is that you come into an HR department and you get steered into a place where the other workers are more like you. So across the platform, you get lots of heterogeneity in a variety of ways, whether it's, well, I'll talk to you about some of the ways, but highly heterogeneous. heterogeneous. Third thing is they, they cede control over hours of work. You can work as much or as little as you want. This again brings me back to the, you know, that first book I wrote, which was all about the ways in which employers controlled hours of work. This is something that is really just so absent from the, uh, the debate about what's going on. And it's really, really important because it, it's, a, it's a dimension of this, super, this high levels of heterogeneity in this labor force and also the way the work gets done. So Uber and Lyft may try to you know, do more scripting than some other for, than, than some other platforms, you know, they'll say, you know, give water or have some mints or, you know, offer people a phone charger, you know, be polite, etc. But for the most part, gig workers are on their own to interact as they like, and particularly outside of ride hail, in uh, hosting for Airbnb or TaskRabbit and so forth. These people are performing the labor process in the way that they want to, um, very much in contrast to a lot of service work, which is highly, highly scripted. If we want to think of you know, the canonical example of McDonald's and the McDonaldization of society, or, or many, many, these are consumer services we're talking about. So many, many jobs in which, particularly lower paid jobs, in which individuals have, are providing services to other, whether it's call centers or retail or, or fast foods and so on and so forth. Okay. So they've given up controlling all of these things. How are they going to make a profit? Well, we know first of all that they're not all making a profit. I'll come back to that. But basically, they're using technology and market discipline to extract labor out of these workers. So the technology is through the crowdsourcing of ratings and reputation and the algorithmic direction, the algorithmic management. So that is there. But they're also using the discipline of the market. So they are relying on the market 
to get work out of workers, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more. So what we find is that um, what we call platform dependence, the extent to which a worker relies on platform earnings to pay his or her basic expenses, that's platform dependence. It varies a lot across the platform labor force. Uh, for many people, it's just an extra. For others, they're wholly dependent. And what we find is that all of these outcomes that we, a wide range of outcomes depend on the degree of platform dependence or, as the light went off in my brain a couple of years ago, the cost of job loss for people. It's not exactly the cost of job loss, but it's, it's a very close cousin. And the second point here, uh, what I call homo variance, is the, is the finding <coughs> that people have very different behavioral strategies or uh, they're not all strategies, behavioral actions on the platforms. There are people who are real homo economici. They're very rational, they're calculating, they're maximizing, they're optimizing, they're doing, they've got spreadsheets, they know exactly how much money they're making, they're you know, trying to figure out how to make more. There are people who have, I call them homo socialis, very strong social dimensions to what they're doing. They'll, they won't charge the max, they you know, are in it for other things, etc. They will, they will not do things that they could make a lot of money for, from because it, they would involve status insults or a whole range of things that are sort of much more social and not income maximizing. And then a third category, much debated in the economics literature, I called homo instrumentalis, which is that people are just, you know, they're just trying to get a certain amount of income that they need. So that's income targeting story, and we can talk more about that. I think we only got these findings because we did a multi-platform study. But, and one of the problems with a lot of the literature is it studies Uber, <coughs> Uber and Lyft, and Uber and Lyft, ride hail, although it is very large within this sector, it's also very particular in certain ways. And, and just looking at that, I think, gives you a distorted view of what's going on in lots of other platforms. Um, but the key, a key point here is that these differences exist not just across platforms, but very importantly, within the same platform. So within the same platform, you have people with very different platform dependence, very different behavioral strategies, very different kinds of outcomes. So let me, let me get to that next. Um, okay, so we did in-depth interviews of 60 to 90 minutes plus surveys. Um, today I'm going to talk about 111 earners on seven platforms. I showed them all to you before, Airbnb, TaskRabbit, that tour of the relay rides, which is the car rental, Postmates in Favor, which are delivery, Uber and Lyft, which are ride hail. We collect data from 2013 to 2016. You had to have done at least five trades or uh, many of these people have done, of course, many, many more. We had started originally with this younger age range, 18 to 34, because that's, they were almost everybody on platforms when we started. We were one of the first people to study these things. Um, and it started out as a, it was very youthful uh, participation on both sides of the market. Um, and we mostly kept with that. The Uber and Lyft drivers tend to be a little bit older, just because, you know, we wanted to be a little bit more representative with them. And we recruited sometimes through the platform, sometimes we sent researchers to orientations, we did advertising, snowball, a lot of different ways. It's a whole complicated thing how to recruit. We got kicked off some of the platforms. Um, I'm going to go really fast just through some of the dimensions of the sample. Um, it's, our sample is about uh, two thirds men and one third women. That's pretty normal. Um, in the sector as a whole, although caveat, one of the things in the notes that I didn't have a slide on is, there's a lot of question about exactly who this population is. We don't yet have a really good understanding of who they are. The studies that have been done are pr pretty problematic. Um, but I think this is, this is not uh, too off, although if we had looked at care work platforms, which are a little bit different, of course there would be more women on them. The care worker, Anyway, I can get into those in the Q&A. Um, on race, we have about 60% white 
10.5% uh, Latinx, 14% Black, just under 10% Asian. Not that different than the city as a whole. These are mostly people in Boston. We have a few others that we did by uh, remote uh, interviews. The really important demographic thing is the very high levels of education of people in the gig economy. They're kind of off the charts. Now we're, we're a little bit higher because we're in Boston, which is a high educated place, but it's, it has started to change more lately, but particularly um, until recently, I would say, even in the lower wage parts of this sector, so even in the driving and ride hail, which are the two, the low wage parts here, you have a lot of highly educated people, either people who are current students or people of college educations. And many of the immigrant drivers, for example, are people of college educations in their home countries and have come here. So to some extent, you know, I think it started, you know, you needed the, sort of some technological facility and a smartphone and so forth to get started on this. Um, it just tends to be very highly educated. Airbnb, of course, is a higher, even higher educated than, it, it, this varies across the platforms. So Airbnb and TaskRabbit and Relay rides tend to be very high educated. <coughs> the first two have higher capital requirements than delivery and ride hail, and TaskRabbit has higher human capital requirements. Something like 70% of TaskRabbits have, uh, which is what we find also, have, have uh, college degrees. Okay, so I've mentioned this platform dependence thing, um, and this is a key variable that we find is driving outcomes, wages, satisfaction, labor process, um, how they do the work, levels of algorithmic control, um, other things too. So dependent workers are people who are wholly or primarily dependent on the platform for their livelihood. They rely on the earnings to pay for monthly expenses, roughly equivalent to full-time workers. Partially dependent, pretty much just what it sounds like, rely somewhat, but either work on multiple platforms, and a, a lot of these they work on multiple platforms, especially ride hail and delivery, or they have part-time jobs, small businesses, or other sources of income. Supplemental earners, platform earnings are not part of their regular income source and are considered extra. Many have full-time employment or activity. And on these platforms, the dependents are the smallest group. Now that differs in some cities with ride hail workers, but even, even there you have, uh, one of the things that happens is you'll have a lot of workers who work a small number of hours and then you'll have a smaller group, they do the vast majority of the work because they work very long hours, so you might have 20% doing 80% of the work. Um, but uh, what we find is pretty uh, consistent with survey data, both in the US and Europe, and it's interesting how consistent this is across lots of platforms and places. Um, the, the bottom is, is all the platforms together, that dependent workers are about 25%. Uh, partials are about a third, and supplementals are the largest group, the plurality, over 40%. It differs a lot in our cases. For example, we don't have any Airbnb hosts who are fully dependent, um, and we have uh, no relay, re relay, relay ride renters who are fully dependent. Um, on the other hand, our Uber and Lyft people are, and that's because if you, if you um, sample by getting rides, since they do most of the rides, you're more likely to get it done. Okay. So I don't show you, I didn't show you the demographics and this because I'm trying to tell you that we have a representative sample. Uh, I just want you to know who our people are. It varies, it will vary a lot by the, the platforms that you include in your sample and also how you sample. Okay, so let me just give you some sense of how, how this De platform dependence thing works out. So supplemental earners on TaskRabbit, they get really good wages, somewhere between 25 and 150 an hour, so really, really high wages. 
They have high non-pecuniary benefits. We have people who say they do it because they're bored outside of work. So they may have really good full-time jobs. We have an MIT graduate who works in a lab, and she just does, she says, I work with mice all day. I want to talk to people afterwards. I hate sitting around being unproductive, you know, earning money to go to concerts and so forth. Because they can be selective with the jobs that they choose, they can demand very high wages. Um, they can also avoid unsafe or problematic jobs. They can see if something looks a little sketchy, they don't need to take it. And they're able to reduce precarity. Earnings work as a safety net. We have people, who, supplemental earners, who are using their earnings to build savings or retirement or so forth. So the idea that this is just creating precarity is clearly wrong from the point of view of supplemental workers. It allows them to avoid low-end exploitative work. So we have a number of people who talked about you know, working in bad low-wage jobs and how much more they like this because they have so much more uh, autonomy. And some manage a portfolio of earnings. Um, and that flexibility and autonomy is really important to a lot of these people. Both scheduling flexibility so they can control. So many people who work on these platforms, they do it because they've got something else going on and that needs to take priority, whether it's children, family responsibilities, uh, a career that they're building, and they need to go on auditions or you know, all kinds of things. That ability to choose their own hours and their schedules is really key. And also to not have a boss is really important. And even for the dependent workers, the ability to not have a boss is something that's highly valued in the labor force today, uh, particularly you know, for people who don't have really high status jobs which, where you have a lot of autonomy. On the other hand, the dependent workers lose a lot of these dimensions. They do get high hourly wages, but there's not enough business to give them full-time incomes. So they're, they're living the dependent earners in this sample who are task rabbits have below poverty or annual earnings. So good hourly wages, not enough demand. And task rabbit has, that's been one of the things with task rabbit. Its wages got really high, but that really limits its demand. You see the same thing going on in ride hail as the, you know, the low, the low wages create, the low prices create lots of demand, but then also, you know, poor earnings for the workers. They lose flexibility and autonomy because in order to make those expenses, you know, they have to make their monthly expenses, they have to take jobs. And this yields wage jeopardy where they take jobs where in the end they're not going to get the wages that they think they're going to get. So they have to take more scammy jobs and those are out there. They have to take more unsafe jobs and so forth. And Another thing that's been happening on these platforms, because we've watched them over time, is a kind of downward trajectory in terms of degradation of the labor conditions. Uh, supplemental earnings for Postmates in favor. So people think it's reasonable extra money. They love the non-pecuniary benefits. So there are people who do it because they like to ride their bikes, so they're going to earn money while they're exercising. Um, if you're a supplemental earner, you can avoid unsafe conditions. So one of our examples is a woman, she does a lot of different gigs. She's a married, sort of middle class woman. She has a kid. She does Postmates with a car. She goes in the evenings. She keeps her daughter in the car, sleep, you know, in the car seat. She will not take the food into the house. She insists that the person come down to her car. Total violation of the rules of the platform. No, no, no. no. Her, I, I don't have the quotes with me. No, 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 no. I will not get out of my car. So the ability of the algorithm to manage the workers is much more limited with the supplementals. Or another supplemental who says, oh, I never do the things they want us to. I don't put them in the, in the bags. I don't use the stickers, you know. And more and more, well, what if the platform, you know, didn't like your ratings and said you needed to come for an orientation? Oh, well, I wouldn't do it because I don't need to. And they don't worry about their ratings. This is one of the things that's been very big in the literature, the idea that all the workers live in fear of the ratings and being deactivated. So they have a lot of autonomy. They do the job the way they want. In contrast to the dependents, and this is a kind of job of last resort. It has the lowest earnings in our sample. Demand is very erratic, so there's, you have the 
afternoon and the evening and then maybe some very late evening. You've got a lot of dead time in the middle of the day. That also happens with the ride hail. Vulnerability to weather and traffic. A lot of these full-time dependent couriers, particularly in Europe where there's a, there's a lot more of this, are getting into accidents. They're having lots of problems. They've also, the dependent workers are more likely to have lost their scheduling autonomy because the, the, they, the firms are putting more pressure on them. And so there's this wage autonomy trade-off. It's also built into the way the algorithms go. If you want a wage guarantee, you have to sign up for a certain block and take everything in that block. So the companies are, you know, in some cases, they're moving away from that total, what I call retreat from control. Finally, uh, the last case I'll tell you about is Uber and Lyft. So the supplementals, the earnings, not as good as they were, but the earnings have been good. People really like the flexibility and autonomy. They use their spare time productively. They reduce costs associated with full-time work. So somebody who has a job in the city but lives in the suburb turns on the, the Uber app, gets somebody to drive in with him, gets the toll paid for, gets expenses for the car and so forth. It, it's you know, it works very well. Um, uh, so they use it to supplement inadequate compensation in their full-time jobs to finance leisure spending. And we have some interesting cases of people who went from part-time to full-time. One really sad case of a guy who felt his job was dead end. He loved the part-time Uber thing, decided to go full-time on Uber, and it was a nightmare because one of the things about these, particularly the lower wage jobs, is people, many people have no idea how much money they are making or aren't making. Uh, we had one interesting interview where we asked the person about their hourly wage. He actually had never calculated. He sat there in the interview and calculated and found out he'd been making $6 an hour. Um, and that was for a, a delivery. And if you've you know, read the literature, you know that once you have a, if you put in a sort of hefty charge for depreciation and uh, you know maintenance and so forth for these cars, uh, it, it erodes the the hourly the net hourly wage quite a bit. So people may think they're making a lot of money, and uh, in fact they're not. And they, there's a lot of worry about what what happens in in April when they, the tax bills come due. So. The dependent earners have pretty much lost control of their hours. They have to work to the market. Uh, they work long hours. So that guy I just talked about was working 12-hour days. Then they get back problems. They have the tax bills. The platforms are constantly changing things. So the asymmetric, asymmetric information is important. And they worry a lot more about deactivation. OK, so that's the story. The market discipline matters a lot, and the technology matters, and it's, I would argue, has created a new kind of firm, which has ceded control over a whole range of things, is using the market to control and the technology. Um, let me just say, I said a word or two, uh, I, I pretty much probably went through this already, homo variants by platform, but just, uh, we found that, um, about 35% of the sample were, um, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, what do we got? I'm missing that one, I think. Anyway, so homo economicus, about 42, 43% on Airbnb, a little over a third on relay rides, 20% on TaskRabbit. Homo socialis is the big one on Airbnb. A lot of them are, are there for social reasons. And then you have that homo instrumentalis, um, Airbnb is not, it, 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 it's pretty simple, um, and mostly people have a social orientation. Um, but Relay Rides and TaskRabbit, we have people who just say, oh, I'm just here to earn some money. They don't think about strategy, they don't, they don't really have a social orientation, they just need to make a certain amount of money to pay their bills. Or as one of them said, I needed cash, she's a musician and work dried up in the summer, I needed cash and I googled how to get some cash and relay rides came up. <laughs> I love that quote. Okay, there's also a hierarchy, I think I've mentioned it, Airbnb is at the top to TaskRabbit, Uber and Lyft, Postmates in favor, and that, that matters also. The hierarchy matches the conventional labor force in terms of sort of race, education, and you know, other things that sort of structure conventional labor markets. 
Okay, I'm going to finish up in a second. I just want to say one thing about our last case, uh, which was a platform cooperative, as I mentioned. And there, uh, it's no longer technology plus the market. Maybe it's technology plus solidarity. But this is a platform that is uh, owned and governed by the artists themselves. It's been very successful. It went a bit up market in the stock photography world. There's a Getty Images is sort of the McDonald's of stock. It's a boutique, so the earnings are better. Because it's a cooperative, it returns a much larger fraction of the revenue to the earners. Um, the artists are very happy. The governance is working well. Highly satisfied mem members. One little asterisk about the governance. There's not a lot of literature, it turns out, on cooperative governance. Uh, they get somewhere between 20 and 30% of people participating, which I think for co-ops is actually not too bad. Um, it has challenges because it's global. There's people from 65 countries, so meetings, you know, you, you can't have synchronous meetings. You also have problems of language. Um, but there are other challenges for cooperatives uh, on platforms. Um, one of the reasons, these are really interesting because I got interested in them really early on because I thought this technology can solve a lot of issues for service providers because it can solve the reputational issues. So you can cut out all those middle people agents and brokers and so forth, particularly if you think of home health aides and so forth, who may take up half of the really high fees and so forth. If you can solve the reputational problems, you could actually give a lot more back to the providers. And, and so it, it, it seemed like a really interesting thing. And also we saw how rapidly these things scaled. Typical worker cooperatives may take years to get off the ground and have a couple of employees. But these platforms were just growing like wildfire. So if you get the economics right and people can just hop onto the platform, you could actually cover lots and lots of workers in a short period of time. So there's a freelancers co-op in Europe that has over 35,000 members and it just, you know, just grows really fast. There are challenges. One, as I talked to earlier, the heterogeneity of member orientations. So just like all the other platforms, there are people on here for whom this is a full-time job. They're devoting lots and lots of money, attention, effort. And then there are what they disparagingly call momtographers, women who take their iPhone out at the breakfast table and take pictures of their cute kids. So those are the, you know, the low hours, the equivalent of the part-time Uber drivers. So that creates really tensions among the membership in terms of what they're looking for, uh, the kinds of policies they want. And the other thing is that on a platform, the unlike a plywood cooperative or any of the traditional worker, Mondragon, the traditional worker co-ops, these are individual producers. And in with, where you have artistry, unlike, say, taxi driving or you know, some of the more uh, homo uh, things where this, the work itself will be more homogeneous. You have you know, very heterogeneous levels of talent. Also, the fact that it was a cooperative attra made it, uh, it attracted some really highly talented photographers who would never do stock photography otherwise. So that was a positive thing. But they ended up having a, a, a hugely unequal revenue distribution. And more unequal than the U.S. wealth distribution. So they've got nine people who get a quarter of the annual in revenue. And, they, and, and so it's, but these people are putting a lot of money and effort into it. So there's that, and then there's one other thing, which is that it's not an open platform. So they capped membership, which is another um, a challenge for, for these cooperatives. Are they going to be open? And if they are, will they be able to get enough demand to get decent earnings for everybody? Or, you know, I think this was a smart uh, choice for these guys, but once you close it, you lose important dimensions of the platform. And then there are the generic challenges, uh, which many, some of which are for all cooperatives, but these are financing, attracting customers, and what we call the tyranny of the market. One of the things that the artists told us about was that 
the buyers wanted pictures of affluent white people. Um, and so that was the market, you know, they, they have to, to succeed, they've got to work to that market. And in fact, uh, where they are, the images are of people from Global South countries, they are listed under travel. So there's a kind of what we call a neo-imperialist, a neo-imperialist uh, market there, um, which the co-op, you know, to succeed, it, it's, I mean, all co-ops face this. They are just firms in a market where if they, you know, have to meet customers. Okay, so <coughs> key findings. I would argue we have a new kind of labor regime here, high heterogeneity across numerous dimensions. Technology is key, but of course the political economic factors are also central. These platforms can be highly desirable for workers because they can offer high levels of autonomy and freedom. But f first of all, the platforms have to allow that. And one of the questions, a really important question to ask is, is this just a transitional stage? Are the platforms, you know, they're not all making money. Some of them are. Ride Hail isn't. I do think Ride Hail is kind of different and special. Um, but can they make money in a world in which they allow people to work as much or as little as they want and so, and so forth? Um, can they can they extract profit without more labor control? We know a platform like Airbnb can do it, but it is a, a platform with a lot of capital relative to some of these others. And so this is, this is a question. Um, I mean, Airbnb is making money and it has been from a pretty early stage um, because it really is just taking a, you know, a transaction fee on something that is much more a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Employment status, uh, should it happen, is likely to transform the whole model. And a lot of the, the people who have been pushing for employment status are arguing that it doesn't need to take away flexibility. And they are right, technically, that the firms can continue to maintain flexibility for the workers, even if they make them employees. But I'm almost certain they will not. Because if they have all those additional costs of employment, they are going to want to get more work out of these workers, and they're going to. Uh, there's one platform that I mean, I, uh, confidentially uh, has. We have found out that what they switched some of the they switched their California workers to employees in anticipation of the change, and their labor costs went up by 50 percent. So I think that employment status is going to make a huge difference, and if it, if it ends up happening, it, it may or may not. Um, but I will, I will just leave it there and open up for questions. Thank you very much. So questions? 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 Comments? She even suggested the questions we should well, be asking. Comments, yes, yes. Questions. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Saving me, yet again. So, um, so picking up off the last thing that you said about employment status is uh, not going to likely be a way to improve these platforms and help these platforms uh, change you know, labor <coughs> process and, and so forth. So how would you recommend um, regulations, uh, norms, anything else to try to make this a more viable model for everybody? Well, I mean, you can go the employment status way, but it basically means they're going to revert to con being conventional firms. So I think that's the first thing. Um, I think the co-op model is the way to go, because the co-op, you can, the co-op, the workers can decide how much flexibility and autonomy they want. Um, they, they might be able to set sort of minimum, minimum hours, but since autonomy and flexibility seems to be highly desired by many people in this workforce, they can also give more and give up a little bit on the profits, because um, they're going to be getting a lot more in profits through the technology and the other efficiencies that they're getting on the platform. So I think that's... I mean, some of the, there are now some small co-ops. I picked this one 
uh, to study because it was the only large size platform co-op that that I could study in the United States. It's actually in Canada, but uh, that I could study at the time. Now there are some cleaning co-ops and I mean there's some small taxi co-ops and so forth. But the thing is that the technology is pretty replicable. It takes over a huge fraction of management functions. And the question you have to really ask, and this, you know, I, I talk about this in my book, is have these firms innovated themselves out of a role? Because the more that the technology does, yeah, you need some of the, the platform designers, but what are the capitalists doing? What are the owners contributing here? Not very much. So, I mean, you know, uh, proponents of worker co-ops have argued forever that you don't need capitalists and workers can do the management, and, but typically you get a, a set of managers. But they basically don't even exist in this world. There are very, very few employees at these platforms. You develop your model, you know, your technology, and, and now there's so many of them and they're so replicable, it just I think that's the way to go. It just makes a lot more sense, and then the workers get so much more of what they what they want or should be able to. That's one follow-up, which is so. One of your key findings is this thing about the dependence, how how the workers um, benefit or not depending depending on whether they're dependent. So, as a complement to this, to make them be able to benefit more, would you propose um, like a universal basic income as a floor? So they become less dependent on um, this kind of employment for uh, their standard of living? Well, you could do that. Um, there are other ways to do it. You could be on multiple platforms. Um, the, worker, the worker platforms also give them more incomes. So they can, they will, if, if they're in a, a worker-owned one. So if they're in worker-owned platforms, um, they could, uh, you know, they can meet their expenses a lot more easily and, and also have autonomy. I mean, the thing about being all in on one co-op is the governance and, you know, if it's, unless, but that's also the, back to that question of size, like, is it a small platform where, you know, the, the workers actually have a lot of say over what happens or are you talking about a global platform where, each member is, is really small, so they probably wouldn't have that much say, and they would just have to shop around for the co-op that does what you know does things the way they want it. Lee. Yeah, really interesting um, project that we have here. I'm curious about the European regulation. You alluded to that as at least being one of the things that people make. So, what are those forms of regulation, and how well do you think they work? So in Sweden, when Uber came in, it basically just had to operate like a regular taxi. So they had to do minimum wage. Um, I think the fares were set. They, the government made a little bit of accommodation because they had a lot of regulations around the, meet, the taxi meters themselves, and Uber was able to get them to change that because, you know, why have to buy those meters when you have everything on the smartphone? So that, that's one thing. And actually, some of that's already come to the US. So New York now has a, a minimum income. It has a cap on drivers. Um, and also the, the minimum wage, both with and without expenses, so they calculate expenses and so forth. In Germany, um, Uber just didn't want to follow their rules. Why they did it in Sweden and not in Germany, I'm not sure. In the Netherlands, they had to close down one kind of Uber driving and they opened up a different platform. They had some called Uber Pop, but now they have the Uber X. In some of them, they work more like uh, sort of hire and delivery services. So they adjust their pricing, they adjust their employment practices, and pretty much you know, a lot of things. And then there, there's work that's just being done um, in Global South countries where you have a lot of other stuff happening. For example, uh, quite unfortunate some of it, contract labor. So kind of, you know, bosses subcontracting and so forth where they might provide the cars, but then they're extracting a lot of it. So you're, you're losing a lot of what you could get from the platforms. Um, in China, which has a lot of, I mean, it's not Uber, it's DD. Uber didn't work out in China, but 
um, it, it's all through these subcontracting relations, which is, I mean, that speaks to that institutional chameleon view because they adapted to, in these places, they're adapting to those existing systems of labor uh, recruitment and hiring and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I thought your point about um, retreat from control was very interesting, which you sort of, as I understood it, uh, opposed to the algorithmic manager uh, theory. And I was just wondering whether there are still elements there that you do think, you know, you sort of haven't disappeared. Um, for instance, uh, in the technology inherent is that workers are less likely to be in the same location so that they could uh, talk about organizing efforts and things like that. Uh, um, more generally, you know, is it different from uh, traditional workplaces um, I'm not sure where I was going with this, but um, you know, where where we also workers also find ways of getting around managerial control, right? And you were saying these platform workers get around managerial um, algorithmic control. Yeah. So I don't want to go all the way in the direction of saying the algorithm doesn't determine anything. Obviously, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are things that it 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 can do. Um, but you know, what we found is that the extent to which people pay attention to the algorithm does vary by their dependency status. So that's one thing. The organizing thing is really interesting. So until recently, everybody kept writing, these people are going to be impossible to organize because they don't know each other and they're, you know, they're not in a centralized workforce. It, it, it turns out it's not true. Uh, we were we were seeing uh, connection. You know, we were seeing that people were making not everybody that people were making connections. So, for example, um, actually, one of the people on my new NSF team <coughs> studied Uber drivers at Logan Airport because they congregate <coughs> at the airport. They congregate there in the waiting parking lots, and they organized a strike uh, some years ago. It, it didn't succeed, but. Um, there are also uh, networks, ethnic networks, and other kinds of networks of recruiting. So people know through their prior social networks, be, uh, know each other before they get on to the platforms. But what we saw in May, and what we saw increasingly now with the Instacart strike and so forth, is that the uh, social media, digital communications, is actually, can actually work uh, to organize people. So there is a union in Southern California, the Ride Share Workers Union. They are doing face-to-face -face work, but they're able to find each other. There are also a lot of driver forums and so forth. So the communication technologies are helping them. And I don't, I don't have the view, I never really did have the view that this is an impossible to organize workforce. Well, the people who are hard to organize are the, the very part-timers because they don't have much of a, of a stake. And, it, but those where you have those groups of very long hour, you know, platform dependent workers, it, it seems that they're organizable. You also see it on the uh, what they call the crowd work or the the digital labor, like Mechanical Turk and so forth. That they have forums and they find each other. I mean, that's all virtual. They don't do anything face to face. David. Uh, I thought you're you're finding that uh, there's such a dramatic difference. Uh, between the experience of the supplementals and the dependents seems to be an important result. Uh, which, uh, assuming that uh, this, these platforms are not going to be mainly uh, co-ops, but owned by someone and operated for profit, it suggests that it's, it's the power, there has to be a power relation to, to have a chance of getting a profit for the owner. And uh, if the workers are not fully dependent on their earnings from it, then it's hard to exert power over them, and their experience is going to be pretty good. Uh, but if they are fully dependent, then the owners have a lot of power and probably will be able to extract profits. They do, the owners do control the technology and the brand name. So this raises the question of whether this can become a, a major alternative uh, source of, of full-time earnings in the economy? Yeah, well, that was the question that I asked on the, that right there. Um, 
So I think, I mean, if you look at some of these platforms, they are able to, to be profitable by just taking a fairly small fraction of the transaction because there are so many transactions. So Airbnb, Etsy, a lot of them, they, they are making money. Um, and I think the delivery also are, are they're, much, they're more profitable. The ride hail is a more complicated case. And I mean, I think in ride hail they could, but first of all, in ride hail right now, the, pl the reason, a key part of the reason they're not making money is that they are subsidizing the rides at a very high level. They're subsidizing about 40% subsidy for every ride. So it's a predatory pricing strategy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because they want to wipe out all the competition. And they think once they're the only game in town, then, then they can raise the prices to become profitable. And um, I don't think that's right. I, I mean, unless there is absolutely no public transportation and nobody can have access to cars, people go on these uh, ride hails in, in large part because they're so cheap. And we know also that, that they've increased the uh, number of rides, you know, instead of walking, cycling, or not going anywhere, a large fraction of their rides are people, who, you know, because they're so cheap. I mean, you can get ride hail at the price of public transportation. So you get incredible convenience uh, at no higher cost, but when, what is now a $5 ride or a three and a half dollar Uber pool is suddenly gonna be the price of what a taxi used to be, that market is gonna shrink dramatically. So they knocked off the taxis easy because it was a um, you know, high, big rents, high barriers to entry. And now they have a model that I, I just don't think is profitable at the level I don't think it's so much the drivers. I think they actually could take a reasonable fee from drivers, but they, they're they just way too big right now to be profitable. That's my, that's my view of it. Because it, the, the extract labor from labor power model is not the only model that works in the economy. Other models are take a fee on a transaction, a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. And that's what these could be. Yeah, Nancy. So I heard a, a, a kind of a research report on care.com that has, kind of fits into what you and David were talking about there. Because it is, in some sense, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, service, and that it's matching potential home care providers uh, or customers. But it's so oriented towards um, attracting uh, customers to use the interface that it has a fundamental asymmetry, which is it allows um, employers to post reviews of workers, but it doesn't allow workers right. to post any reviews of uh, employers. So they don't get any information about whether they'll be uh, treated well or, or not. And it seems like an interesting mix of kind of a control over workers within a peer to peer. Yeah, and, and you, ha you definitely have, you've got that variance across the sectors. So like the, the, on the rye right hail, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they used to rate the customers too. And we just don't know. We don't see the ratings that they give. So for one of the things that I've heard, I think is true, is that if you're a low-rated customer, you will get matched with a low-rated driver. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, whereas, you know, Airbnb has fully bilateral, but then there are issues around when you reveal. So, do both sides have to, I mean, good practice is that both sides have to put their reviews in before they can see the other. That's a problematic feature and I think one of the things is because you know care.com is trying to be like the uber of its sector which is to grow really rapidly and um, there's a little bit of research on it um, that I've seen and to me one of the interesting things about care.com is I mean I absolutely agree with you about the asymmetry and it, it should be symmetric um, 
you've got people moving from a problematic, but you know, has its pros and cons, very informal labor market to a more formal one, which should give them some benefits and you know some. Uh, I don't mean literally benefits. I mean like, you know, they're going to get their pay instead of the employer not giving it to them, or there are supposed to be a you know set of guidelines that the the buyers are supposed. Um, versus others who are going to be losing autonomy. So it, you know, there are independent contractors who have lots of autonomy who go onto platforms and then they're more subject to platform rules. And that's a kind of interesting thing that's happening in some of these markets, how platforms are changing the relationships. Can, can I just talk yeah. a little bit about the co-op aspect of it? Uh, I mean, the, it seems to me that Care.com is a, is a really good example of eliminating a very inefficient middleman. That there, are, you know, the, there's small care contracting companies that really do extract huge rents right. from both customers and workers about it. And so there's been a lot of discussion of cooperative uh, home care. There is a really good, you know, really big cooperative home care firm in, in New York City. Right. But the, it seems like the, the problem with the cooperative model that you're talking about is it's a co-op for kind of the management of a really large national or international company. And it, in a way, that preempts, it preempts the, op, the, the potential for local co-ops. You know, like local care, local care providers to get together to provide their own kind of interface and model because, it, you know, uh, it just seems like a lot of the power of these platforms comes from the huge economies of scale that have to do with standardizing across local communities. Yeah, well, some. I mean, the the uh, I think I said something about you know size of co-op and how oh when I was talking about the governance. Yeah. So you've got. Um, so yeah, so there's the cooperative workers, I think it's, I know the one you're talking about in New yeah. York, which is not a platform, as I understand it. They may be going, moving some stuff. They're all, there's a nurse, there's a very small nurses one that's starting somewhere in the Midwest. I mean, there are a lot of these, there's a whole movement now for these. I agree that, that localness is, brings you a lot of very positive things. But partly it depends on what you're talking about. So for stock photography, where there's really no interaction between the buyer and the seller, the big or freelance, sort of generic freelancing or digital labor, those things, the bigger, more global even platforms make more sense. I think for, for the, some of these care services and other personal services, smaller makes sense. Brightly, which is a house cleaning co-op, is franchising itself now. So you're getting the benefits of the small, but they're gonna get the economies of scale because they're gonna yeah, all the use, use the, use the uh, technology and marketing and stuff. Okay, let's take how many more? I'll speak faster. Yes. Uh, I'm curious to see, uh, understand better maybe whether we could fit or how we could fit uh, companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, for that matter, right? Because these, those these are digital platforms, right? It seems like there's something else going on. They're highly profitable. Is it the same kind of labor? Is it a different way to be these categories that fit all that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I didn't get into it in the definitions. When the sharing economy what came up, it, all the discussion of it was how novel it is, and there's never been anything like this before, and uh, you know, all of which was you know, mostly <coughs> propaganda. Uh, John Zeisman and Martin Kenny wrote a really important paper in which they said, do not think about these sharing services as something new or different. They're just, a, a, they're just another part of the ecosystem of the platform economy platform and the big platforms, of course, being the ones that you've talked about. So they are trying to think of them as just sort of minor, you know, add-ons to these big platforms. And of course, these platforms were important investors in some of these. I mean, Google is a major early investor in Uber, for example. Um, so I do think there are dimensions of, of these consumer service platforms that are very similar. but. I don't, the, the sort of, the economics, the business, you know, kind of the 
you know, the services, etc., are different. I mean, on Facebook, it's all that free labor, right? They're subsisting on all the free labor of our posting and our eyeballs and all of that, which is different here. This is more conventional in the sense of service provision. I mean, these are people, this is, I'm talking about offline service provision. Uh, if we think about Mechanical Turk, what is it's doing? I mean, it's doing all that, you know, AI work for those other platforms. So they are related. Um, and I do think that that's, so you might want to look at their work, Martin, Kenny, and John Zeisman, to sort of think about that ecosystem, platform ecosystem. Really quick. The last two, very short. Um, yeah. Um, so, thinking about something, I mean, for the potential for the cooperatization of this, I mean, it seems to me that the biggest non technical barrier to entry is advertising, right? I mean, you're going to get a ride share, you, it's the, basically there's one or two, Uber, but I don't actually understand the difference between them, but I'm sure there's something. But how can you have a cooperative model in which you need this enormous amount of money to, to make it work? And I'm wondering, I mean, what are the owners doing here? I assume it's advertising, and also, is it regulatory fixing? I mean, are they lobbying in some way? And how would that interfere with having a cooperative version of this? Well, I mean, the cooperative probably wouldn't need as much regulation because they wouldn't be doing a lot of the, you know, things that people are, although that, that's not completely the case. I mean, if you look at issues of traffic or, Airbnb, I mean, there's a fair BNB is a cooperative alternative to Airbnb that's starting up. I mean, they may, if it get if it got really big, it would create the same problems. Airbnb is like a whole other story because it's an insider outsider issue rather than a labor exploitation. But the thing about most of these services, and this gets back to Nancy's point, they are local services. So Uber never should have been or needed to be a global platform. It wanted to do that because it thought that was the way to make you know, huge amounts of money. Um, but you, all you need really, you need interoperability across the uh, apps. So like the Easy Pass and so forth that it works in lots of different places. We could all just have local apps and then when we travel they, they could work. So you don't actually have to market to huge numbers of people. You have to market in a local area because these are all face-to-face -face services. So the low, I mean, Airbnb is a bit different because it is deals, deals with travel, but the rest of them are, you know, the errands, the delivery, and the ride hail, which are the big, you know, those are big segments, are all local. What's the question over there? And that's the last one. So I'm interested to hear what you think about the size of this market. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics did a um, survey back in 2017, and they found that about only 1% of uh, those employed were actually operating in these electronically like, mediated platforms. There's plenty of reason to believe that that's an understatement, that it might be biased downwards. So there's other data if you look at like, um, the, uh, the survey of household economic and uh, decision making from the Fed. If you look at the data in that, it might look like it's around 10 to 12 percent. So I'm curious what you what you think of the size of this market. And it seems to speak to the the site or the um, kind of point you brought up was whether or not this is a transitional phase. Is this something that's actually going to change the nature of the Yeah. So the contingent worker survey by the BLS was kind of a disaster because they asked about full time, and you know all they needed to do was. Actually, it's, it's an old friend of mine who ran that thing. I didn't talk to him beforehand, but anybody who was studying the sector knows that the full-timers are a small fraction. So that one's way too low, and they know it, and they're, you know. The shed is, I think it's probably around 5%. The, the, the bank data, the JP Morgan Chase data, is, uh, gets you to about a 5%. Um, of the labor force participating. When you go to the shed, you're adding in a lot of other things like selling stuff on eBay and, and so forth. So if you're talk, just talking about gig work versus resell, because the biggest thing that people do is sell stuff on eBay um, in terms of online earnings. Um, 
So it's not that big yet. I do think that more and more of the way we interact economically is going to move on to platforms, and I think that there is a potential for a in, uh, significant increase here. So, I mean, you think about care work, I mean, there's a lot, a lot more care work that can go, other domestic service, I mean, just, uh, so I, I think there's potential. I mean, it's never going to be 100% like some of these, you know, end of employment people thought. But you know where you also have a lot of these freelancers and so forth are, are moving on platform too. You, I mean, I didn't talk about some of the Upwork and you know their higher end platforms. You've got lawyers on platforms. You have doctors on platforms now. So you, I think you're going to see more and more of it because it offers a lot of efficiencies. Um, but what economic model they use is going to be a different story. They may not. You know, they may use a very different economic model. They may just use a conventional model, but they s use scheduling algorithms or you know, something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you.